Hello and welcome back to An Old Man Watches, where today I'm going to be talking about the 1964 historical epic, The Fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, and the film begins in almost exactly the same place and time as the more recent Roman epic, A Gladiator, with the ailing emperor Marcus Aurelius battling to keep Germanic tribes from invading his northern territories on the Danubian border of the Roman Empire. Now, according to this film's narrative, Marcus Aurelius is a secret egalitarian, an unusual thing for an emperor to be. Uh, he wants a successor who will reform the empire and grant equal rights to all of its subjects. This rules out his son Commodus, who just can't wait to be king. And so Aurelius intends to nominate his good, loyal and honest general Gaius Livius as his successor instead. However, before Aurelius can announce his plan, he is poisoned by conspirators who expect to secure their own political future by putting Commodus on the throne, which leads to exactly the opposite of what Aurelius wanted. While Commodus was not part of the murder plot, he did know that his father planned to deny him the throne and therefore spitefully dedicates himself to undoing all of Aurelius's policies of equality and levying huge taxes on the provinces so that he can aggrandize himself and the city of Rome. Now, as you might imagine, this causes massive unrest, which, coupled with ongoing issues with the Germanic tribes, plunges the entire empire into a series of destructive wars. As a senior Roman general and a loyal servant of the lawful Emperor Commodus, Gaius Livius is, of course, a central figure in these conflicts. But as the emperor's brutality becomes ever more apparent, even this most faithful and diligent of men must begin to question where his real patriotic duty lies. Now, the behind the scenes on this film uh, is quite a wild story, uh, far more interesting than the movie itself, to be frank. Director Andrew Mann conceived the idea for the fall of the Roman Empire shortly after he completed filming the historical epic El Cid. He pitched his idea to producer Samuel Bronston, who approved the project. Filming was slated to begin in early 1962, with El Cid star Charlton Heston intended to headline. But in December 1961, Heston emphatically rejected the script and walked away from the project. The film was put on hold and the elaborate sets that had already been constructed for it were demolished and replaced with sets for a film that Heston did want to make. It was called 55 Days in Peking. Now, Heston may have walked away, but the fall of the Roman Empire would not lack for star power. When it finally did begin filming, a year later than originally planned, on an entirely new set of sets, its cast included Sophia Loren, Alec Guinness, James Mason, Christopher Plummer, and Omar Sharif, amongst others. And those performers would do their work on sets that had taken more than a thousand workers a full seven months to reconstruct, and which sprawled over an area of more than 50 acres. Little wonder, given that this was the second time the sets had been built, that the film was the year's most expensive. It cost $16 million, which would be roughly three times what it went on to bring in at the box office. Uh, the film's financial failure, in fact, drove Bronston Productions into Chapter 11 bankruptcy. During those proceedings, Bronston gave incomplete and misleading evidence uh, and was convicted of perjury as a result. He appealed this conviction all the way to the Supreme Court, which ultimately upheld his position that, as his answer was literally truthful, it did not constitute perjury, no matter how misleading it might be, uh, which is an ironically apt theme, given the first major flaw of this movie which is that it is wildly misleading in any number of particulars, beginning with its very title. As the film itself acknowledges at its conclusion, the Roman Empire did not actually fall at this time. Nothing close to it, in fact. While the empire did go through a wild and tumultuous year following the real-life death of Commodus, it would endure for a long, long time thereafter. And while it would never again reach the extent it had under the earlier emperor Trajan, many of its most famous emperors, such as Diocletian and Constantine, were decades or even centuries in the future at this time. Now, director Andrew Mann has tried to justify the title of the film in face of all this, including the eye-popping assertion that we don't say this was the fall. Uh, it's, it's literally in the title, sir. Uh, in any case, that's merely the tip of the nonsense iceberg. The film's depiction of Marcus Aurelius as a secret egalitarian reformer who did not want his son to inherit, for instance, is complete fiction. Aurelius had first proclaimed his sons to be his heirs in 166 AD, more than a decade before he died, and three years before his death, he had raised Commodus to be his co-ruler. So it's not like Commodus was being acclaimed as emperor, he already was co-emperor. Similarly, 
while Commodus would prove an erratic and capricious ruler, there's actually comparatively little military conflict in his reign. Plenty of political conspiracy, but not the endemic open warfare shown here. Now, of course, this is also a movie that has a completely fictitious character as its protagonist, presumably because the real story of Commodus's death was a pretty squalid one, uh, and also blithely makes that character the lover of Commodus's sister, Lucilia. Um, film's attempt at a happy ending is have those two characters finally able to live out their lives together, which in real life would have been very difficult and or really gross because Lucilla actually died 10 years before Commodus did. So basically, the movie The Fall of the Roman Empire does not actually depict the fall of the Roman Empire, and what it does depict is a whole lot of things that never happened. But hey, being non-historical doesn't necessarily mean that a film is bad as a work of entertainment. Unfortunately, the fall of the Roman Empire falls down there as well. Now, the first reason for this is that it's completely fictitious protagonist I mentioned. I suspect the film wants us to see Gaius Livius as a principled and decent man caught between two irreconcilable impulses. On the one hand, his personal friendship with and loyalty to the Emperor Commodus. On the other, his firm sense of moral right and wrong. The movie also clearly wants us to see Livius as the rightful emperor, hence the fiction about Aurelius planning to nominate him as successor to the throne. So we've got a morally upright man who is also the intended emperor versus the cruel and erratic Commodus. It should be a shoe in that we cheer Livius on right. Well, perhaps it would be if he wasn't a useless lump. But by golly, a useless lump is exactly what he is. Livius spends almost the entire movie actively supporting Commodus, making him complicit in the Emperor's crimes. Only when the film has a scant 30 minutes left to run does he find, and trust me, in this movie, 30 minutes is scant, does he finally decide that Commodus has gone too far. At which point, he is comprehensively outmaneuvered by his frankly far more charismatic and entertaining adversary. Our supposed hero must ultimately rely on Commodus taking a colossal, inadequately justified and wholly unnecessary risk in order to actually come out victorious at which point he reverts to being a useless lump and abrogates any responsibility for trying to fix the chaotic state of the empire, a chaotic state which he bears much of the responsibility. And I've already talked about the scale of the film's production in terms of both physical and financial. And I, and I made a reference earlier about the scale of the film as a viewing experience, which can be summed up in one word, bloated. The fall of the Roman Empire runs a whopping 185 minutes, which means that we spend a full two and a half hours waiting for Livius to just do something about Commodus already, while the movie itself plods its way through events the New York Times aptly described as massive and incoherent, technicolor spectacles, tableaus, and military malaise that have no real meaning or emotional pull. I found this a long, grinding, tedious film to watch. Three hours in which my eyes kept drifting away from the drab non-entities that the film wanted me to care about and across to the clock, which was remorselessly counting every second I was wasting in watching this. So do yourself a favour and give it a, give it a miss. Next time, it's Pride Month, so let's take a look at a same-sex romance film, or more specifically, a same-sex musical romantic comedy crime thriller mashup film in the form of the 2014 offering Girl Trash All Night Long. But that is next time. For now, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you've seen The Fall of the Roman Empire, what did you think, basically? Catch you next time.